Um, we're hoping that, and he's hoping more than I am actually, because it's, it's his baby, that this is going to take place in some other schools. The, um, the information that Lee Davis has on their football team, all the data that they're collecting, it, it, it shows it's working. Um, my stepson is the assistant basketball coach at Lee Davis, and they haven't even got into the big part of the aerobic, anaerobic stuff, but he can already tell that the kids are doing better on the court, they're not as tired, they went to basketball camp with seven kids last week, and were able to play teams with 10 and 12 kids. So they were, their kids were go, going longer and harder and uh, stronger. So without any more information, uh, information or delay, um, Mike Craven? How long do I get before these two guys jump and tackle me? Um. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know when to move. <laughs> we're slow. Okay? You'll, you'll see it coming. <laughs> How many people today uh, had a chance to see Coach London talk about leadership? Okay, great stuff. And again, if that type of information here and over and over, sometimes we can't hear it enough. I want to thank the, the people who made this possible. Doug Barry with Alan, Allen and Allen. He's going to give us some very valuable information as coaches that we have to be able to, to think about for the rest of our careers. I want to thank Nathan Stan, Nathan Cox. He put this, helped me put this together. And Dr. Clifford Morris, who's with Virginia Cardiovascular Specialists. This is a program that we put together for the last six years, and it's, and it's basically trying to get to people in leadership roles that can make a difference, make it happen. So I think too much today, we, we bypass and think somebody else is going to be able to take care of it for us, when it has to be our responsibility. What does True Fitness Solutions do? First of all, we investigate and we research failures in preventative health care. Now this flyer, that everybody hopefully has. This is an example of failure, okay? A, a measure, not success. In 1970 to 1975, we had 21 young men across the United States die of heat stroke. We had, from 2003 to 2008, we had 18. Now, back in the 70s, when there was water restriction, there were salt tablets, there were plastic suits, they were practicing at the hottest time of the day, there were many mistakes that people like Mr. Simon and this is what it was, it was leadership. Don't allow that to happen. No matter what a person's opinion is, it, they don't allow it to happen. But we still had 18 during the time period where no water was restricted that they passed away. So we have to say to ourselves, if these are things that are, that are projecting failure, what do we still need to learn to do better? Okay. Um, I'm just going to talk from right, right here until Nathan get back. Exercise science. Guys, all leaders base everything off what's proven. So when we, when we talk about things today about uh, exercise science, these are things that are not debatable. Let me back up one, one more time. I'll just slide ahead. Let me just say that i got a slide ahead. Um, I, want, I want to be able to realize that when we talk about the safety of parent wants, and we talk about the performance that an athlete desires, we've got to also say today, we have to protect our coaches. I know the greatest influence in my life being, being a, uh, in business for 27 years was my coach. I never would have survived being in business myself if it wasn't for him. But the issues with liability, we have to be concerned about it. And, and Mr. Berry is going to talk about this, is tort liability as a legal injury or wrong, the most common tort filed against coaches is negligence. To determine negligence in the case of a coach, there's four questions that have to be asked. Do you owe the players a duty? Was the duty breached? Was your breach of duty, was your breach of duty responsible for the player's injuries? And is the extent of the actual injury, what is the extent? These are things that have to be asked uh, in a court of law. Okay. Exercise science. Now, this is where we're not going to talk anymore about our personal opinions. So I want you to picture this. When Joe Paterno admits that he restricted water in his college career for 10 years, there wasn't a general practitioner anywhere at that time that couldn't have told you that if you restrict water, a young man's blood volume drops. And if a young man's blood volume drops, his cardiac output drops. And if his cardiac output drops, he can't release heat 
from muscle metabolism to the environment. He actually stores heat the moment dehydration sets in. How did that, how did that go on for 10 years? When it's a fact of exercise science. And we've got to talk about it with leadership. We, we, we knew at that time it was wrong, but it still went on. Okay? So we want to talk about the things we can prove, and we don't want to be scared of change. Change is for the better if it makes everybody better. Okay? This is what we've got. Heat gain, heat storage, heat loss. So if I'm sitting in right now 100, 102 degree weather, I can gain heat from the radiation of the sun. I can walk, and I can gain heat from my muscle metabolism, or I can run, and I can increase that 20 times above rest based on the intensity of the effort. Now, with, with all these issues being said, I want to ask your opinion. We just talked about opinions really don't matter. With all the information that's out there today, what's the number one reason for core temperatures to rise? What would anybody say today, Coach? What's the number one reason for core temperatures to rise? Humidity. Okay, very, very good answer. Any other answer? Well, do we agree it's humidity or is it some other factor? How many people would say dehydration? Okay. Now the issue is the answer to it from the Heat Institute is the intensity of effort. So the number one reason for core temperatures to rise is not the environmental temperature. It's the intensity of effort. Who controls the intensity of effort at the practice? The coach. Okay, so that being said, we have some responsibility to know who's the most heat tolerant and who's not. Okay? What would be the number one defense at being able to release the most heat? Would it be your one rep max in the bench? Would it be your shuttle run? Would it be the 40 yard dash? Or would it be what we call aerobic strength? The ability of the heart to pump more blood than the guy beside you. To get more of the heat from the core released to the shell. So what we've got to realize, the number one defense today in, in preventing heat-related storage is having a high level of aerobic strength. And how do we measure that just like a cholesterol test? How do we measure it like a one rep max in the bench? These are all measurable ways as coaches we can be aware who's heat tolerant and who's not. It just has to be practically applied. Coach, you hit it on the head on the nail. No matter how fit you are aerobically, if you're playing at 100% humidity, their core temperature is going to rise like crazy. So we have to be concerned for the humidity. But I can be in 100% humidity, and I can be walking like this, and I can tolerate it. But if I'm out there doing high intensity, maximum effort done prolonged, and the humidity is, the humidity is up in the point where the sweat can't evaporate, we're going to cause them to drop dead. So very good, strong coaching point. All right, Nathan. Aerobic strength, we're going to keep hearing that all today and how we measure it. Look how the athlete who is trained, that means we have to have periods of aerobic strength training in yearly cycles. But these athletes that are trained, their bodies for any degree of muscular work start to sweat sooner. They start to release heat to the environment doing a certain mechanical work. They, their core temperatures don't rise as fast because of their great ability for heat loss. But again, as we got any strength and conditioning coaches? That's what I am. Any strength and conditioning coaches in the audience? All right, how much have we concentrated on absolute power, speed, and we've neglected the aerobic energy system? And we've made them bigger, faster, stronger, but when you ask, when was the last time we did any nonstop steady rate work? It's just been completely eliminated. And that's, and that's a mistake. All right, Hayden? So how do we measure aerobic strength? It's a test. It's a test measuring the body's delivery and muscular systems. It's a test, again, that determines how much heat a person can produce and how effective you are at releasing the heat. So it's a test, it's just like a cholesterol test, the kid can't fake it. What it is is what it is. Now, let's take a look for 18 to 25 year old men and 18 to 25 year old ladies. Look at what's excellent. 60 or above it is considered a high value of aerobic strength. I tested the freshmen at University of Richmond. We tested them and we tested Coach Hayden's Lee Davis football team. And you saw some, some very uh, equal comparisons. 
We've got young men in high school, 22 milliliters. We got 16 year olds that when you test their VO2, 16 milliliters, excuse me, 22. I've got men in their 70s that are that high. Now, if you had a man 70 years old walking out to practice with a football helmet, and he said, Coach, I want to run with the, the young men. All right, now, what's the difference in that? And a 16-year-old has got the same measurement. Okay? He's severely deficient. So whether he's got a big, large mass or a small mass, that's a significant reduction. The American College of, Cor of, the, the American College of Sports Medicine signifies anything under 40 milliliters is a risk. Okay? Now the issue is to say, we've got young men in the 20s and we've got young men in the 60s. Was it any different at UR? No. We had young men that could bench 390 at UR and tested out at 28 milliliters. That means when we go to find these peak scores, and we're going to give you a demonstration of it, these guys are grabbing the handles and they can't sustain the work. It's a peak effort, finding peak heart rate, finding where he's blowing off carbon dioxide. It's an exact measurement. Okay. <coughs> Now, this is something that, again, we haven't talked enough about as well. There's, let me just back up. There's many cumulative factors that are making our kids die. Okay, so back in, two, in 2009, we had three die. Somebody just told me this morning, they heard on the news that somebody passed away already. Okay, for 2010. But this, this issue is to say, the kids today are bigger. So whether it's muscle or whether it's fat, they're bigger kids than the 60s, even than the 70s. So the issue is to say, if some young person, heavy muscle or heavy fat, they're actually a walking heat bomb if they've got a low VO2. And why do they have low VO2s? Because as strength and conditioning specialists, we're belittling, belittling how we should train them. So if I've got somebody that has to be acclimated, are we talking about going to a school bus, walking to the school bus in heat? Are we talking about playing nine holes of golf? Or are we talking about the first day showing up and we're going to be doing gasses? We're going, to, we're going to be doing play drops. We're going to be doing things that make them work the anaerobic energy system to max. It produces the most heat. So the, these issues are to say the bigger people with low values of aerobic strength, it's a deadly combination. So again, recognize it and then, and then from that standpoint, change it. All right, Nathan. This is how you change it. When you develop aerobic strength, these are the physiological changes that have to occur for a MET score to go up. The lungs learn to process more air. If you can process more air, you can also develop more red blood cells to, tran to transport that oxygen. You develop more blood volume. They say Lance Armstrong has a quart more blood volume, the water content of the blood, than any offensive lineman in the NFL. Now, the NFL guy is 6'6", 300. But when you look at his circulating water content of his blood, he looks like spaghetti sauce when Armstrong looks like fine wine. And does that have anything to do with releasing heat to the environment? Everything. More capillaries, more blood, blood supply routes. The heart can pump more blood. Liters of blood can circulate at a higher, faster rate. And we've got to be able to set safe. It's important to sweat. It is also important to have a circulatory system that can make that blood circulate at a high rate. And think, the heart has two jobs. Get blood to the muscle and get blood to the skin. So kids with low cardiac outputs, that's a problem. Okay? They say Paris Island, and if you compare it to football practice, the young man at Paris Island who's overweight and has a low MET score is eight more times likely to die. Okay? And so these, this data collection is invaluable for us to look at. All right, so once Nathan Go back to that last slide real quick. I missed the point. How many people have heard the term body mass to surface area used? Body mass to surface area. So in 1955, the starting tackle at Tech was 6'2", 215. Today, 6'5", 330. So if I've got a person who's tall, but basically 6'4", 200, he's got more surface area than he does body mass. But if I got a young man that's 6'6", 300, we got a young man that's going to Virginia Tech next year, Nick Aikman, and he's a physical specimen. This kid benches 475, uh, just a tremendous, powerful athlete. He's got a scholarship, not because he, he's played much football, but he's physical. But he's got a mess score of 30 milliliters. And that's just as, that's just as bad as my athlete that's 5'6", 300. They've got the same 
sustainability because Nick spends a lot of his time in the weight room and not doing aerobic work. Okay, so it's a, that's a mindset we got to change. But the more mass you've got to surface area, again, the more chance you have of heat storage. All right, now let's go. Now, let me just say this. It's not just about how much oxygen or how much blood you can deliver to the muscle, but the efficiency to be able to do more work without heat storage is heavily contributed to the mitochondria. Anybody in this room right now that has a young man that's overweight, do you think that social society pressures don't affect him? How many people have ever seen the TV show The Biggest Loser? How many people want to throw up watching that TV show? Okay, so here's a TV show that hugs and cries and does all this emotional stuff for people losing 20 pounds in a week. So does a young man think there's anything dangerous about losing three pounds a week when that's been promoted all over the country as health? How much weight you can lose? So if the most fat that can be metabolized is based on mitochondria development, and the people who have the most mitochondria are endurance athletes, how can we encourage an overweight kid to go into cumulative dehydration because he's heavy? So you say, Johnny's getting in shape. Good job, Johnny. Lost seven pounds this week. Johnny's not getting in shape. Johnny's just becoming a fat, dehydrated guy that's going to drop on us sooner or later. Okay? So we got to take this with our responsibility because society tells him you're doing a good job losing a bunch of weight. Coach Simon, athletic trainers. I mean, here, if we didn't have the athletic trainers, they don't let them lose weight between and out practices, right? So here's a great step. Speak on that. Well, yeah. And I've noticed that there are some new people who have come in here who haven't here been during the week. One of the things that we promote uh, very heavily at our high school is the weight charts. Kids who are weighing in and out after <coughs> practice, weighing in and out before and after every practice. And, and the thing that Mike's talking about is if we have a kid who's losing more than 2% of their body weight, we know by statistics, we know their performance is going to be uh, drop at 2%. There's a performance drop at 2%. So if we get a kid who, from morning practice to the end of afternoon practice, is down 5%, they're not practicing <coughs> tomorrow unless when they weigh in tomorrow morning, they're back up to at least the 4%, so they're going to lose the 2%. So we're monitoring that weight loss, because like Mike said, it's a water weight loss, and we've talked about all that stuff during the week, and I'm sure he's going to hit it, so I'm not going to take away his thunder, but... We, we're, not, we're not looking in season for people to be losing weight. In season is not when we're looking for weight loss. We need energy, we need energy stores, we need all those things for our competition. So we're not looking for weight loss in season. Now, we're gonna, again, we gotta pick the pace up. And again, guys, we can come out to your school and go over this in, not in a rush sequence, but right now we've got a timetable we gotta live by, but there's a lot of information to cover. This is a research project done at Yale, but this is showing the blue that this man's mitochondria development is 300% higher than this man. This man eats 5,500 calories a day, but he's got a 76 milliliter VO2. So this man's muscle cells have a, a need that when he goes to do anything, even if it's a five minute mile pace, he can use more fat for energy than the rest of us. That's from physiological need. It also prevents lactic acid from accumulating. And it also prevents the body to have more blood to release to the skin. So the more oxygen that can be extracted, the more blood and cardiac output can help the skin. <coughs> People that don't have high mitochondrial development, even if it's 15 to 20 percent cardiac output that releases heat to the environment, for a person that, that again has less mitochondria, it's going to be worse. So this component of the cell controls everybody's weight gain in life. It's not as much about that they're eating Twinkies all day as it is their mitochondria development from the time they were kids to old is declining like crazy. Okay? So if you look at this muscle cell, just blow it up, Nathan. If you look at the, the gentleman who's untrained, the untrained muscle cell, then the size of the mitochondria and the number, as well as the number of enzymes that control the rate we can use fat for energy, are not as high in concentration. The athlete that's got the most of these will oxidize lactic acid at a higher rate. So when we go to do anaerobic drills, that's the way game football is played. We have to do that. I'm not taking away from that. But the athletes with the lowest aerobic strength can oxidize it. 
So what, what happens is it starts to accumulate. And then that's the same issue if the white heat storage comes up. High intensity work beyond what the athlete can recover from. <coughs> All right, so we've determined the lactic threshold, where lactic acid starts to accumulate, is a concern in any physical activity, especially if you're going to try to develop aerobic strength. You can't train above this. So when Vince Lombardi made the comment, fatigue makes cowards out of all of us, I'm going to show you where he was correct on that. Okay, let's go to the next one. This is based on sedentary people, but you can see how this applies to our athletes. A sedentary person, whatever his peak VO2 is, cannot sustain that. He can't sustain that for five or more minutes because lactic acid accumulates. So what's more important than the peak VO2 is where's the heart rate where lactic acid starts to accumulate that inhibits it to be sustainable. And if it's not sustainable, we're not going to cause the physiological changes for heat loss. Okay? Now, I want to show you, this is Dr. Morris' score. He's letting us show you what he was able to do. Um, <laughs> this score that I'm going to show you. You didn't let him run the computer. <laughs> <coughs> what I want to show you this is an actual test that gives measurement exact to each individual. And you're looking at, a, Dr. Morris played with uh, Jordan at Carolina, so he, he's an athlete. He knows the importance of physical con conditioning. But I'm going to show you how this test works. him using the most amount of oxygen before his body could not deliver anymore or use anymore. And look where it says time from 23 seconds to 225. Look how he, at 225 he's progressively going up using 10.9 milliliters. Now right here where it says RQ, that RQ where it says 079, I'm trying to push him in mechanical work to get that above 10. So we're looking at <coughs> VO2, we're looking at RQ, we're looking at heart rate, and we're looking at the amount of fat being metabolized and the total amount of calories being burned. Now these are all going to be individual to every kid, but that's what makes this program so successful. It's individualized. Now look how when we go up to six minutes, look how Dr. Morris right now at six minutes is using 22 milliliters. He's at 0.75. His heart rate's only jumped up to 98. He's burning 9 calories a minute out of 10.6. Very high utilization of fat. This brown line is fat utilization. The green line is heart rate going up when you see to the right. Now, let's watch when Dr. Morris gets the 1-0 on the RQ. Where it says RQ, when he gets the 1-0, look what happens. When an athlete gets the 1-0 at that heart rate of 154, that's it. Look how the rate of fat utilization for him completely shuts off. That means if we had an overweight kid doing high intensity boot camp work, why are people being taught that? Anybody know anybody doing that? High intensity boot camp work for, for weight loss? I mean, in my area, it's, it's sold every day. Okay, so the point of it is, is there a, a set point for each individual where the utilization of fat completely stops and you're burning 100% glucose calories? All right, so irrespective of that, Look how Dr. Morris' peak, this is his peak, 52 milliliters. Now, out of that 52 milliliter peak, which is a measurement, he's safe to play the game of football. If you look at his exercise script, look how we can actually train where we have, based off the MET score now, the exact heart rates that cause the most physiological change. How many people know of people doing aerobic work using 220 minus your age? Why are we using formulas <coughs> when we can measure it exact to the individual? 
And if I've got a young man who's going to be doing gassers, high intensity work, and that's going to cause heat production to be 25 times above rest, shouldn't I have some type of steady rate program that doesn't allow lactic acid to accumulate? And at the same time, know how high to train him as an individual so we can see those physiological changes? Or are we in agreement with that? Does anybody disagree with that? Because the only way we can have change is if everybody agrees. And it might, be di 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 it might be different than what we're used to doing, but that's okay. We can learn to change. But that's the point here, is we've got young men right now that don't have cardiovascular systems high enough to play the game the way we're coaching. And, we, and that's the issue. The issue of liability is, if you don't know the young man's mess score before he steps out on the practice field, and the tragedy comes, that's going to be a question this gentleman right here is going to ask in the court of law. And that means coach, athletic trainer, school board, principal, as soon as the question gets asked, okay, if metabolic heat production comes from high-intensity effort, mechanical work, not sitting in the heat, are we testing our people that brings credibility to readiness? And if we can test this, which we can, can we give out prescriptive programs months before the season starts for the young men that are low? How many, would, how many would say right now, if we had kids in the 20s, and they already, they already talked about the College of Sports Medicine, saying that, let me have that, that one there. Let's say that, that it says it has to be 40 milliliters. Well, if you know that you've got 60 kid roster, and you've got 25 of them in the 20s, would any coach not want to know that? In, in other words, you're not going by looks. You're going by who's the most heat intolerant by testing. Now, this is from the National... This is the National Athletic Trainer's Bible. Okay? People write, this, is this held in authority? Absolutely. And, and we've talked about that all week. Every, every position statement, and again, I think there are 12 of them that the National Athletic Trainer's Association, if, if you're doing something that is against that position statement, these gentlemen are going right to that in their arguments. So if there's a heat position statement, which there is, a hydration posi uh, position statement, and you haven't even looked at it, the first thing they're going to go to when they're d arguing with you is why you didn't do that. Because the information is there, it's readily available, and we talk about it all the time. So it takes good people, and when, it, and when we say that the, the young man died of dehydration, did, did that come from coaches changing immediately, or did it come from lawsuits? What made the issue of giving kids water? Lawsuits. That's the truth. Okay, so we gave this out to coaches everywhere today. See this little room? They blew, me, they blew us off. I mean, that's what they did. Coach, I want to give you something that's valuable. You need to hear it. My trainer handles all my heat-related issues. No, he doesn't handle that. Because it is, this issue of conditioning, you set the conditioning cycle. Here's what's written. Individuals who are untrained are more susceptible to heat illness than trained athletes. As the VO2 max, which is the MET score of the individual, improves, the ability to withstand heat stress improves independent of acclimatization and heat adaption. Independent. So that means a kid in Minnesota, obviously we have to have some time to acclimate to different environments. But the kid in Minnesota that's got a 6 2 is going to come to Virginia, and he's still going to outperform the kids that are at 20 deal who's living here their whole life. Okay? And it says here, the core temperatures of at-risk individuals that are unfit, overweight, or unacclimated can rise to dangerous levels in 20 to 30 minutes. We have to recognize this. Okay? Find which kids are heat intolerant. Then give out prescriptive programs to develop the aerobic energy system. Prescriptive. We're not talking about a one rep max on a dead or a hand point. We're talking about how do you develop a different energy system that every one of them, when you give them that workout based on this individual need, get better. Mr. Burke. All right, something's going to get put up here that I allowed, although I don't want it. So we can read a little bit about who I am. It's not really who I am as a person, it's what I do legally. Uh, you want to take that there. <laughs> but I'm going to talk over this while you're reading it. As soon as I think everyone has read it, then I'm going to ask him to minimize it. Um, my name is Doug Berry and I'm the president of Allen & Allen. It's a personal injury law firm that's been in Central Virginia for 100 years. 
So while you're reading some of this, and I'll minimize it in a minute, let me tell you why I'm really here. Let me ask a couple of questions. How many of you are coaches in Virginia? How many of you are athletic directors and coaches in Virginia or just athletic directors? How many are you from private schools in Virginia? How many of you are from outside of Virginia? Yeah. Here's my only problem. I'm going to talk for five or eight minutes because I've been given 15 about who I am and why I'm here. I'm not going to give you a history of immunity in criminal law in Virginia, which I can do and I do all over the state. I'm just going to give you the way it is right now. And I can do that in two minutes. Um, I was a football player. I played football uh, in Northern Virginia. I'm not going to say this in case anyone still knows any of those coaches that are still around. I'm not going to insult anybody. I played from 1970 to 74, four years. I graduated in 75. Uh, we got no water. We ate salt tablets like candy chicklets. <laughs> Some people were even allowed to use chewing tobacco during eating practice and then were laughed at when they threw everything out. Uh, the coaches got all the water they wanted. Uh, those of us who were defensive linemen had to wear the zoot suits also. To make us stronger, you know, more heat tolerant. And uh, we had two days back then, long two days. And the one little water spigot that was there had one side of the Not for the coaches, but for us. So anybody that had any kind of illness just gave it to everybody else. Because they're all sucking on the same piece of money. Uh, now, I went to UVA. I wanted to be a doctor. I have some learning disabilities in math. Go ahead and minimize it. Uh, I have some learning disabilities in math and chemistry. And I can get straight A's and everything else. So I didn't get to be a doctor. I did not want to be a lawyer. But I didn't know what else to do. So I'm plausible. And I went to law school to become an FBI agent, but the federal government wasn't hiring that. And I got out of law school, became an assistant commonwealth attorney in the city of Richmond for two and a half years, and then the FBI was hiring again, and I became an FBI agent for many years. And then I came back to become a prosecutor again in Hanover County, where I still live, and Mr. Craven lives. <laughs> and in the East End, I live in the real part of Hanover County. <clears throat> My sons both went to public school. One is a tech now, and he's at one of his third year. The other is a senior rising at Patrick Henry in uh, Montpelier, Virginia. My youngest son is not a great athlete, but he tries real hard. My oldest son uh, lost the AAA mile in his year by about a second and a half, running on a completely half-torn Achilles tendon, which had been labeled tendonitis. Uh, it was just operated on because that's how it was labeled at Tech two years ago. He was in for a year and a half. And Dr. Avalar at MCB just prepared it. So he's in rehab right now after his other spirit passed. The reason I am here is very simple. That is just part of me. For 15 years since I went into <coughs> private practice, I started noticing my buddies, cops, ESM people, Firefighters, some teachers, coaches, in civil court. I didn't know what civil court was. I've been a prosecutor in an FBI. What are you here for? And I had a car accident and all this happened, blah, blah, blah. And so I started a program to go around and start teaching. Now, I haven't been able to talk to very many coaches. It's hard to break into. But I've talked to a lot of police, a lot of firefighters, a lot of emergency medical services people. I'm on the state symposium for. Uh, Emergency Medical Service, and I teach both on the west side of the mountain for the people who can't afford to come into Norfolk and in Norfolk. And I simply teach, I'm not a doctor, I was a cardiac tech for a while back in the 70s and 80s when I was on the National Ski Patrol, uh, but I don't have a license anymore. I teach liability. I teach you how to stay out of trouble and I teach you what the rules are. <coughs> and the only thing I can't teach today is <coughs> the gentleman who's out of state or who anybody is, every state law is different. Now there's a lot of similarities, but I can't teach that. Uh, your, your state could be worse than ours as far as uh, the rules, or it could be tougher as far as uh, liability is concerned and immunity are concerned. 
For the folks who are here from private school, can't tell you for sure whether the immunity laws apply to you. Uh, we think they do, but there's no Virginia Supreme Court case on point on that, so we don't know for sure. But here's the problem. If there's anybody doing what my coaches did still, what I just, just described to you, uh, in football or any people sport or anything like that. Uh, in wrestling practice, I lost 12 pounds one, one day. I didn't win the match. I just didn't want to wrestle 300 pounds. God. So, <laughs> I went down to 185 real quick, but that was stupid. I should not have been allowed to do that. Uh, and then I threw the shot with the distance. I was actually in 74, second in the state in the shot put. Uh, at 190 pounds. I was strong, I was fast, uh, I could bench press over 400, and I knew nothing about aerobic capacity. When I went to UVA, uh, my senior year at, at, in high school, I, um, in a scrimmage game against a county south of us that was already finishing their program in a rainstorm, and seven of us got hurt, including me and I shattered my ankle. You get to redshirt in high school. So six weeks later, I came back a little too soon to play. I tried to walk on to Virginia, and three days later, I managed to do my football career. So, so I stayed on the track team for a while. There was a coaching change that I didn't like, and then I rode crew the rest of the time. And crew was a club sport for men at Virginia at that point. It still is. Um, and it's Title IX. It's just that's just the way it is. It's the rules. And uh, I didn't learn anything about. VO2 max or aerobic capacity or lactate thresholds or anything like that until I started rowing. And I still row on an ergometer now and I compete on the other in different you know, things around the state and in different states. Uh, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a rowing machine that can be linked up by a computer uh, and you can get a good workout on it. Uh, I could never have a VO2 max test and the way I tested myself was working up slowly. And then I would wear a heart monitor, and I would be watching myself. And then I saw 